Okay, recording is on. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 106, our course on interpreting scripture. We're going to take a moment to pray and then we will get started. <clears throat> May I just request somebody to please uh, um, lead the class in prayer? You can just unmute your mic and pray with us and then we will get started. Anyone? Please. Father, we pray this morning that you would minister to us, Lord. He prepare our hearts to receive from your word. We pray, O oh God, that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit. We submit passive to your hands, O oh God. Use him uh, to reveal the mysteries of your scriptures and help us to understand uh, how to interpret scripture as you have written it, Lord Jesus. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> right. Good morning. Once again, I apologize for last week. I uh, couldn't do my classes. Uh, just had a lot of pending work to catch up. And uh, yeah, there's still a lot of work, but uh, we will keep going. All right. So we had uh, just a quickly review. We had just transitioned into tools and methods of Bible study. And uh, so we will uh, move forward in that today, uh, just looking at uh, in the various methods of Bible study. And then we will start getting into the whole process of interpreting scripture. We'll talk about, uh, hopefully we'll get to it today. We'll talk about the illumination of the Holy Spirit, you know, the inspiration that comes, how the Holy Spirit guides us, and uh, then get into the practical side of, of interpreting scripture when you look at culture and grammar and other things, you know, a lot of other things we will cover as we go along. Okay, so let me go ahead and um, share uh, the PDF uh, where we stopped. We'll just uh, review. And then we will move forward. So we were, we started this chapter of tools and methods of Bible study. Uh, we explained why there are different uh, versions, English versions, and how the translators have tried to, you know, do their translation. And therefore, we have different versions, English version, uh, versions of the English Bible. And we recommended that if we are somewhere close to the um, the original text, if we, or if you use a version that's close to the original text, that's very good for Bible study, and uh, that'll really help us. So then we talked about, we just gave an overview of the methods of Bible study. Uh, we talked about, you know, when you devotional or passage study, you're looking at a few set of verses. Then we talked about character, biographical sketches, where you can study the character of a person or the entire life of a person. Then there are thematic studies. Um, you can do a topical, you can do a theme-wise or a word-based study. Uh, there are chapter study approaches. And then there are book study approaches. You study the whole book, right? So let's get into a little a little bit more detail here on, on doing these things. And if you, if you go to our church website, uh, you know, you, you find sermons, sermon notes, uh, you find books, um, which, you know, which kind of tell us, you know, which are actually, you know, uh, expressions of these different forms of study. And maybe I'll just mention some. So if you're interested, you could go and either listen to those sermons or look look them up. So you see how they're practically done. Um, so the uh, overall, uh, a very, very a common approach to, and a very simple approach uh, in in looking into the scriptures is what is known as, commonly known as the inductive Bible study. Uh, that is, you take a passage, when you, when you are doing a passage, or we usually do this in our devotion time, when you're reading uh, a, a portion of scripture, it could be a chapter, it could be less than a chapter, it could be more than a chapter, whatever passage you're taking. Uh, you kind of do, uh, all of us, essentially, we do an inductive study. 
What does that mean? That means after you read the passage, you are observing very carefully, you know, what's going on in the text. Okay, this is what's happening. Observation. Then you say, what does the text mean? Uh, this is the meaning. Then you say, application. What can I do? How does it how does it apply to me in my present situation? So that's the inductive Bible study approach. A very simple and a very practical observation, interpretation, application. So that's what we do uh, in our devotional method. When you're doing your daily devotions, typically most of us are doing that already. You know, when you read the passage, you, you are thinking through like this. And you could even do it verse by verse. So you look up, you know, you go through each verse and you, you do the same thing, but you do it at a worse level. So you can do it at a passage level. You could do it at a worse level. And of course, you can, you know, extend it to um, uh, bigger portions of scripture. But you're doing the same thing. You are observation, observing what is happening in the verse or in the passage or in the chapter. Then you are saying the uh, interpretation. What does it mean? And then you're saying application. How do I apply? Right? And many of us are already practicing this. Then we also talked about another way to study, where you can study a character or you can study a biography, the entire life of a character. So in a character study method, we said, you know, that you're looking at a certain time segment, uh, the, the life of a of a Bible per a person, a time segment, and just looking at how do they conduct themselves in that situation. So we made mention of Daniel. So if you look only at Daniel chapter six, how did Daniel behave in that particular situation? You're doing a character study. You're saying, you know, this is what the good things he did. He still prayed, he was strong. He didn't, you know, he was courageous and God came through for him. So that's a character study. But if you study the entire life of, a, of Daniel, that is, you know, from the start to the end, whatever we see recorded in scripture, then you're doing a biographical study. And both of these studies are very useful. This character study is usually when you do a single sermon, you know, if you're, you're preaching a sermon, you take uh, a, a time portion of that person's life and you bring out insights from that. Uh, so usually that, that, that in a single sermon, you might do it. But you know, if you're doing a sermon series, then you're 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 you're, you're doing a full-fledged study of the person's life, and you take time to look at you know how they journey through God, and through their years in life, and how they also developed, how they also grew, um, they made mistakes, but they overcame mistakes, and so on. You know, and um, uh, example, example, um, uh, usually uh, in the life of King David, you can uh, uh, break his, uh, not to break, but you can divide his entire life, the biography of his life into four stages. You know, so you, you can talk about the formative years of David. That means uh, what we see in, you know, uh, the early stage of his life, uh, First Samuel chapter 16, basically. Then you see, uh, then you have this next stage of his life, the famous years where, uh, you know, he became, he killed Goliath, he became famous. You know, he was a hero, a national hero. And then you have uh, the third stage of his life where he was the a fugitive. That means now he was running for his life. He was in the wilderness. And what all happened there during the wilderness, the fugitive years. And then you have the, uh, the, final years or his his uh, his years when he actually became king and he you know he fulfilled uh, his assignment as king of israel but even in those those that stage of his life the fourth stage uh he you know he made mistakes and so we can look at you know we can break his whole life into these four stages and we could examine, you know, how did he walk with God? What did God do? And what can we learn? And it's a beautiful study. We need to do a biographical study of a Bible character. So like this, you could look at Abraham, you could look at Jacob, 
uh, you could look at Moses, you know, and, and, and we can learn a lot from uh, biographical study. So <clears throat> that's one way, uh, that's another way of studying the word of God. So really our, our interest is not just in the hum human person, but our interest is in knowing God through the life of that person, you know, how that person walked with God. How did God deal with that person? So ultimately we are learning about God. We are learning about the ways of God. We are learning the heart of God, but it's happening through the lens of somebody's life and their walk with God and the teaching of scripture. Then there is a very different way of studying. And this is probably for me personally, it's something I do a lot, uh, which is a, a thematic or a topical or a word study, right? So uh, uh, it, it is very broad, uh, uh, you know, very broad way, but um, you can do by topic, you know, so um, what does the Bible say? about this particular uh, topic. And you go through uh, or, or the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation <clears throat> on that topic. So uh, if you, you know, uh, there could be, you know, on atonement or like I've just put some examples here. You know, uh, what does the Bible say about atonement? What does the Bible say about divine healing? What does the Bible say about Holy Spirit? Uh, what does the Bible say about faith? Uh, so so you, you pick a topic, a subject, and then you study from Genesis to Revelation on that subject so that you get a full understanding of that subject. And this is actually very important for those of us, you know, uh, when, we, when we want to understand what does God say about this subject, about this topic? Right? So it's a topical study. You, you trace that particular topic throughout scripture. Very similar to that is a theme, you know, so thematic. Again, these are overlapping. So you pick a particular theme in scripture and uh, you follow that theme throughout scripture. It could be on redemption. It could be on worship. It could be on the end times. Uh, it could be you know, our identity in Christ, a theme that you find in scripture and you follow that throughout the Bible. You know, what does God say about, yeah, you know, what does the Bible say about uh, death? What does the Bible say about heaven? What does the Bible say about, on, 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 you know, on, on, on the theme of uh, sorrow or whatever, you know, any, and you just look at it throughout scripture on that particular theme. Similar to that is a, is a word study. So you look up a particular word and you see how that word is used throughout scripture. An uh, example would be spirit. Okay, how is the word spirit used in scripture? In the Old Testament, the New Testament. Oh, then you will discover, okay, there's only you know one Hebrew word for spirit, ruah. There's only one Greek word for spirit, uh, pneuma. And, but then depending on the context, it can be used to talk about Holy Spirit. It can be talk, used to talk about evil spirit. It can be used to talk about angels. It can be used to talk about human spirit. Oh, now you're, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, but there's only one Hebrew word, but it's, you know, it's translated in different ways, referring to totally different things, uh, depending on the context, very interesting. And then you say, okay, then let me, you know, dig a little deeper and say, okay, about the human spirit, what is it? What do I see in the old and what is I so see in the new? And then you begin to see that sometimes it's translated as heart, <clears throat> uh, you know, sorry, the word heart and the word spirit seem to be used uh, very closely, you know. And so you, you know, you're studying a word like spirit but then you begin to explore a little bit more. You begin to understand spirit and heart are used synonymously. Uh, sometimes, you know, spirit, heart, soul are used very closely. Uh, and so it kind of, you know, it, it opens your eyes to, okay, this is how the, the scriptures are handling this word. 
and uh, and then the other thing that you can also do is to look up the root meaning what is the root meaning sometimes you discover other things you know for example you study the word love and then you'll find out oh there is uh, you know oh there are more than one word that's actually translated love uh, because in english we are saying love but the, in, in maybe the greek you know what uh, there are many multiple words there's the agape or the god kind of love there's the agape love there's eros love there's a filio love and i think there's even a fourth word i forget uh, friendship love and so there are many different greek words but all are translated into english and love oh so you're starting with one word love but then you're discovering that actually there are multiple words in the greek that are translated love and they all mean different things then they're all used in different contexts oh but in english it's always translated mostly it's always translated love oh uh, you know and then then you begin to understand that agape is used only in the context of god's love so like that you know there are different where you study a word and it kind of goes through uh, uh, there's a lot of learning that happens so you can do um, you know a topical study the thematic study or a word study right? and of course we will talk about the tools that you can use when you uh, do this all right I, I heard a, a ring on the chat so let me see if there's a question here Philly oh John Paul okay so I missed the Philius storage Eros Agape. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. So, um, now we move to chapter study. So, here's uh, again a different way to study. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you do is you take a chapter in the Bible. Uh, and and then you begin to study through that chapter, right? Now, uh, a, 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 an, an, an easy way, an easy way to do this is, especially if you start in the Psalms, you know, you can take Psalm 23 example, <clears throat> which I think many of us would have done. You know, you take Psalm 23, it's a single chapter, but it's very beautiful. And, you know, the whole, psalm 23 it's one chapter but it has so much uh richness in it talking about god and talking about what he does for us as his own people so you could take a single chapter like that you know and the psalms are a good place to do this kind of study right uh now when you're studying uh chapter there are two approaches of course one is what we refer to as a summary and then there, there's the other one which is the sorry uh, analysis uh where you're going into the uh, the details of the the chapter so in a summary in the in the summary approach you know you are trying to bring out the or you know, it's more like an expository. It's you're trying to bring out the essence, the essence of that chapter, right? Um, you may or may not necessarily deal with all the, of course, you're gonna interpret that chapter in, in the context of the book in which it is written, but you are not, too worried or too much worried about the rest of it. You're focusing on the chapter and you bring out the summary of it, right? You're highlighting, you bring out the highlights, the key highlights. So typically what you would do is you would say, well, I can break this chapter into three sections or four sections. You know, this is what happens. And this is what, you know, his, this is first, one, two, three, four, four sections. And then you, you kind of, you're weaving through that chapter. You bring out the key uh, insights from the chapter, the key lessons. And you're dealing with what does God want me to learn from this chapter? So it's, it's more of a highlight or a summary of the chapter. Okay, that's it. If you want to do a chapter analysis, in a chapter analysis, you're getting deeper into the text. Okay, so now 
you're going to look into uh, everything that's around it. You're going to look at the book. Okay, this book was written to these people. Uh, uh, it was written for this reason. It was written in this time. And so now he has already de developed all this in the previous chapters. Now you're in this chapter. Therefore, this chapter, you know, you're getting into the details of it. So uh, you're, it's, a, it's an in-depth analysis of that chapter in the context of everything around it. You're looking into why it was, you know, why, why certain things being said uh, and what things that were said preceding it that in, impact why it was said then and how it's going to, you know, lead to other thoughts coming up in the rest of the book. So it's an analysis of that chapter right it's in you you look up usually look up the the meanings of the words and so on so it's a little bit more in-depth study of the chapter and uh, usually the chapter analysis is what we do when we get into our book study so in a book study you will typically analyze every chapter in detail you know and, and you get down to the worst level uh, as you would in a chapter analysis so uh, example of uh, chapter summary methods. Um, uh, recently, we did a sermon from Psalm 40. Uh, uh, it was, I think, in the month of December, and the sermon title is "I Waited Patiently." Uh, uh, that uh, that sermon uh, uh, is essentially Psalm 40, and it just does a highlight, a summary of Psalm 40. It just brings out the key things. It's not an analysis, but it's a highlight. It's a summary. So that sermon I waited patiently on Psalm 40 uh, that was done recently in December is an example of a chapter summary. Um, chapter analysis is, of course, when we do uh, in-depth uh, study. And uh, there are, you know, uh, you find it on, find on our church website, we've done book studies, we've done Ephesians and Corinthians and several other books. And there we go into uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse uh, explanations. So um, that would, those would be examples. When we do book studies, we actually go do chapter analysis. We get into the deep depths of each chapter and verse. The last one, uh, our, our book study approaches, and uh, you know, in in our third year, uh, in, in 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 this Bible college, we do book studies. So we study uh, several New Testament books. Mm -hmm. We also do Daniel and Revelation, and uh, when we're studying that, we we go through you know prophetic scriptures in depth. Right? So. Uh, Typically, what you would do is you would do a book background. Right? So the book background is, of course, you're trying to understand uh, a lot of uh, uh, information about the writing. Right? So when was it written? What were the, uh, where was it written? What were the events going around it? the culture, the environment, so that then what we read in the book becomes that much more rich, more meaningful. So getting the background to the book actually is a very good thing because the meaning of the book comes out so much better. You know, so much, okay, this is why this was written and this is what this is what God is dealing with you know um, either in the life of the church or in the life of his people so getting to know the background which nowadays thank God you know we have all the tools and we have the resources that have already put all this information together for us so uh, uh, other than you know reading it uh, our effort it has you know our work has been reduced a lot so we just have to make the time to read uh, you know people have put this information together for us so uh, getting to know the book background is very very helpful it also helps us in the interpretation 
because then we are mindful that we interpret it in that context. And we will see as we go further in this course that understanding culture is very important in interpreting the scriptures. We, that's, that's one of the factors we take into account and we will explain it in a, in a, in a coming lesson. So book background, studying the background of it. The book survey is your giving an overview of the book, like more like a, a, a highlight of the entire book. So it is not an in-depth study of every chapter, but you're surveying it. It's a high level. Okay, uh, you know, this book was written here, and these are the main key points, the key things that you find in this book. Uh, these are the, you know, maybe the theology contained in this book. This is what is uh, what the book has when it comes to uh, if it has anything about uh, the spiritual realm, about angels and demons. This is what the book says about salvation, or this is what the book has pointing to Christ. So you're 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 doing a survey, but you're just bringing out you know highlights of the book. It's not an in-depth study of the book. Uh, and it is useful uh, when you know people want to just get the gist of the book. Okay, what does this what is this book about? What does this book have to say? The essence of it and the gist of it. So it's more like as a highlight, the key highlights of this book. This is what this book is about. So it's a book survey. You're not necessarily getting into all the details. Okay, so one is a background background method. One is a survey method, and then the most detailed study uh, approach to studying a book is what is known as a synthesis method. That means you are getting into the book down to every verse, right? And to do that, you should have the previous two already done. That means you should know the background. You should have an overview. Okay, this is what is being so you know the book is okay. This is what is being addressed, and now let's get into the details, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. You're getting it. So that is a very detailed study of the book, which is very very useful. Okay, so you're bringing in together, bringing the previous two works together, the book so the book background, the book survey, and then you're getting into the details of the book. So for example, in our third year, we will, I, I usually teach the book of Romans and I love it, you know, and it's like a beautiful, one of the best, uh, uh, what is it, doctrinal epistles, the book of Romans, you know, it's like if you understand the book of Romans, you understand the, the core of New Testament doctrine. That's how great, you know, that's how uh, complete and how uh, solid uh, the book of Romans is. So of course, when you study the book of Romans, you have the background, where it was written, by whom it was written, and to whom it was written, what was the time, uh, what was the kind of audience, the Jews and the Greeks, and what had happened to the to the believers there at Rome, and why was Paul writing to them? You know, that background is there, which is very beautiful. And then you also have a highlight, the, the storyline of the book, how Paul starts in chapter one from the very basic, why we believe God exists, to what happened, you know, uh, to what happened to when man sinned and God brought in the law. But what about those who don't have the law? And then how God began with Abraham and how Abraham by faith, you know, was justified. And, but then Christ came, what did Christ do? So, you know, in Romans five and okay, we are saved, but then he, he didn't just save us, but he dealt with the power of sin, uh, Romans six. And then in Romans seven, how miserable we are, you know, we can't deal with sin in our own lives, but Christ did the work. And then Romans 8, the Holy Spirit comes and helps us. And then he talks about, okay, but there are problems in the world. There is the corruption in the world. Uh, but then the Holy Spirit helps us through all of that, Romans 8. Then he says, okay, now I need to explain something about God's working with the Jews and the 
and the church. So 9, 10, 11, Romans 9, 10, 11 is an overview of, you know, this is how God is working with the Jews and with the church and how he's going to bring it all together, Romans 11. So it's like the highlight is Romans 11, 26, you know, God brings everything together. Then, okay, now that we've understood how God is working with the Jews and the church, let me get back to the church. Romans 12 to Romans 16. This is how the church should be living today. Right? So there's a storyline from Romans chapter 1 through Romans chapter 16 that you can see beautifully. And how Paul brings it out. And the, his style of writing is very different. There are a lot of rhetorical questions in the book. He asks a question, he answers it. He asks a question, he answers it. So that's a style of writing. Then you get into the chapter and the verse. Uh, you know, so you have the background, you have the survey, and then you have the synthesis, the details, the teaching of the book, right? So that's a beautiful example of, you know, uh, uh, a book study. And that is so important for all of us to learn how to do that, okay? So, the last thing I want to share here is on the tools we are going to use. But before I talk about the tools, let me see if there are any questions so far on these methods that we have covered. So any questions on uh, the methods of Bible study? Anybody has any questions you want to ask? Any thoughts, any comments? Everybody's following this. Okay, um, I'm assuming uh, all of you are good. You're all following me. Okay, um, so we'll just move into the last bit, which is, um, I just want to share a little bit about the tools. You know, um, uh, the tools that we could use. So there are many, many Bible study tools that are available. Um, uh, and I will, you know, I've just given you a list uh, over here. Um, there is, but what I want to say is, personally, uh, I, I would recommend Eastward. Uh, it's a free software that you could download uh, and i've been using it for a long time from the time it was released i think it was 2001 when the first uh, version came out and uh, since then there have been you know new versions and so you download the latest version um, um eastward is one of them and of course there are other uh, other um, uh, uh, you know, a U version, there's a Blue Letter Bible, there's a Logos software, there's BibleGateway.com. There, there are a lot of these other online Bible study tools that you could use if you'd like. Now, I don't, I, 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 I'm not very familiar with these tools. I don't use them too much. Now and then I might, you know, I might uh, refer, I mean, rarely. But the one that I use almost daily is uh, ESOR. Right? So, I would encourage you to do that if, if you would like to do that. And uh, uh, I'll just quickly show you Eastward. Uh, it looks very complicated, of course. I'm running it on my computer, my laptop. Uh, it's very, very easy to use. Now, I remember, you know, prior to 2001, in those days, before that, when I would study the Bible, you know, I would be having my King James or the New King James Version Bible in front of me. Then I would have a physical Bible. I'd have, you know, four or five different versions opened in front of me. Then I would have the Wines Dictionary, another book, thick book. Then I would have Strong's Concordance, another thick book. So, you know, that's how I would study, you know. I would have all these Bibles around me, books around me on a big table. And that's how I had to study uh, in those, uh, you know, those 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 years. And that's how, you know, when you did when you didn't have computer and software, that was how manually you have to study, and it's a very time-consuming process. So if I wanted to look up the Hebrew word, I would 
go into Strong's concordance, you know, okay, find out the verse, find out, okay, this is the Hebrew word, or this is what it means. Then maybe open up the wine dictionary for the Old Testament, look up the meaning, you know, and then open in every every version, turn to that same verse to read how, you know, how did that version translate that verse. That's how I used to do my study. Uh, it was very time consuming. Just to study one verse, it took so much time. But, you know, with computers and with software that we have today, it is so easy, right? So when you download eSword, you know, here you can see that I have so many versions of the Bible. Uh, uh, many of them are free. The only paid version here is, uh, is I think, the New King James. And I, I don't, uh, I think the, yeah, I think the Passion Translation may be paid. But now all of these other, other versions are actually all free. They're all free versions. So you can download, you know, all these different versions. And if I want to, you know, look at one verse uh, in, in, in a different, uh, you know, uh, in different versions, so example, if I, First Corinthians. So now all the books of the Bible are listed here. So I click on First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. And if I want to read this verse in different versions, it's so easy. I select the verse and I select compare. So right here, in just a click of the mouse, I'm able to see the same verse in different versions. You know, and I've got the Greek interlinear, so I could actually even see what the actual Greek means. I've got it in Hindi here, and and so on, right? So I can just quickly read in 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 a few minutes. I can, you know, read what this verse, how this verse is rendered in uh, you know so many different versions of the Bible. Previously, if I had to do this, it would take me maybe a good one hour you know, or, or not one hour, maybe half an hour. You know, I have to physically open every Bible to First Corinthians 10, 23, physically turn there, read it. Now here I can just, with a click and a scroll, I'm able, we are able to see it. So it is such a big blessing. And the advantage um, of reading the same verse in different versions is because then you get to understand, okay, so this is how, this verse has been translated or yeah, rendered in different versions. Um, these are the sort of nuances of that same word, you know, so that word could mean this and so on, right? The other thing that I almost always do is I always look up the, the root words. So uh, because this is New Testament, you look up the Greek. So if I click uh, click on this tab, King James Version with Strong's numbers, it gives me the Greek words. So First Corinthians 10, all things, all right? So if I put my mouse over, it gives me the Greek words. So I can see, you know, I can actually look into the Greek. So now I can, un, you know, get some insight into, okay, what is the Greek word used and what are their meanings? And also, in addition to that, are the dictionaries. So previously, I, I used to have only one dictionary, the wine, Wines Expository Dictionary. But now, you know, um, there are multiple dictionaries. There is, of course, the Wines Dictionary, but there's also, um, and I had the Strong's Concordance. So the Strong's, of course, would give you the meaning of that Greek word. But then there's Thayer's Dictionary. Uh, you can also look it up. It has usually a little bit more uh, meaning of that word. And then you have other dictionaries. So this is also free. So what I usually do is I will read the Strong's and I will also see, you know, how that word, what is the meaning, the different meanings of that Greek word. So you're getting into the details of, okay, I'm understanding what is being said here, right? Um, and then so the use of dictionaries is very, very good. Now, um, you can also search within uh, the Wines Dictionary example. I could click on the search 
uh, icon here, uh, sorry, here. And uh, I could search in Wine's dictionary. You know, sorry. So if I look up the word faith, so you see how Wine's, Wine, this is the Wine's dictionary. He tells us, okay, faith, the Greek word. And he tells you so much about that word, how it is used, you know. So this itself is a big learning. Yeah, okay, so this is the word faith. It means firm, a conviction, and so on. And then it talks about how it's used throughout the New Testament, right? And then uh, also there is, you know, the other variations of that word. So you can see the meaning. So this is a very useful thing when you, when you are doing your Bible study, looking up the word. So these are things I, I do very, very often, you know, in, in studying the scriptures. And then, of course, there are commentaries. Now, about commentaries, uh, there are, you know, that there, there are probably hundreds of commentaries out there. And there are hundred, you know, so many commentaries free. So I would say, you know, don't try to overdo it. You, know, you cannot read every commentary that is there. And, uh, you know, uh, don't confuse yourself with all the commentaries. Because commentaries are, you know, work uh, that the man, the man has shared their ideas and thoughts and so on. So I just limit myself to, uh, I think, just two commentaries, really. Uh, I have the Dakes um, commentary. Uh, uh, now, uh, not everybody may agree with Dakes because Dakes comes from a spirit-filled Pentecostal background. And that's the reason I have Dakes, I, you know, because it's a spirit-filled Pentecostal type background. Um, but not everybody may agree with everything that Dakes says. And that's okay. You know, you just read to see what, you know, what he has done. Now, Dakes has spent, you know, Dakes, when he was doing his work, he spent more than 40 years uh, writing, uh, studying the Bible and writing his commentary. So it's really a very useful resource. And then there's the, another one by David Gersick. Now, the reason, again, the reason I chose David Gersick is because it's a spirit-filled Pentecostal background. So he comes up, but David Guzik draws from a lot of other commentaries. So he has actually done a lot of work for us. And he quotes, and you will see in his, when you read his commentary, that he quotes from um, other people, you know, and he will mention it, uh, you know, in his commentary that he has quoted from. So for example, yeah, not here, but yeah. So for example, yeah, he quotes from Adam, Adam Clark commentary. So he, he has already quoted bits and pieces, quotes bits and pieces from other people. So he's already done a bit of work. And he comes from a spirit-filled Pentecostal type background. So he, you know, he was part of Calvary Chapel, the, uh, the early spirit-filled uh, chapel, uh, uh, the um, church, churches that came out. So, um, so these are two commentaries that uh, I, I usually look at. And then there are others who more give you the meaning. They like dictionaries. They kind of give you the meaning of uh, the words, Vincent Word Studies. Uh, F.P. Maya is, is a commentary and I just kind of look at it. I don't necessarily pay too much attention. I don't necessarily read it, oh, everything he says, but it's just one additional thing. And then this is for cross-reference. Where is that word used in other places? So basically two main commentaries, Dakes and David Gesix. One extra one, F.P. Maya. The others are more of uh, like dictionaries and cross-references that I use. So don't overcrowd yourself with too many commentaries. Select, you know, maybe two or maximum three that you want to use and, uh, and work with it. So this is a tool I would encourage you to use um, in your study of the word, uh, because now you're getting into the, you can start looking at the Hebrew and the Greek now words, you look at the meanings um, and so on. And then, of course, uh, other thing is word searches. So you can search, you know, um, and let me just change this. Sorry, let me go to, so usually when I do a search, I work with the New King James Version. 
Uh, so, you know, uh, you can search for the word glory, right? So you will find, so with just a simple search, you can see that the word, it gives you a full list of wherever the word glory is used in the Bible. You know, so many matches. And then you can study, like we said, you know, doing a word study or a thematic study or a topical study. This is very useful. You know, you can find the word glory is used in all these places. Uh, you can do a partial match and it'll pick up, you know, even the words glorious or, you know, uh, related um, search. So all these things you can do with the software. Okay. So let me pause here uh, and uh, see. Any questions? Um, Pastor, when we usually do a Google search, uh, uh, this Matthew Henry commentary pops up very frequently. Mm. Uh, do you have any suggestion regarding that? Um, yeah, I personally, I mean, I know he is, Matthew Henry is one of the more well-known, um, Matthew Henry's commentaries are one of the more well-known commentaries. Um, I, I, I I can't say too much because I haven't used it uh, very much. I, you know, I just maybe glance through some of those things. Um, yeah, so I can't say too much. Uh, I don't have it. I mean, I and I, you know, I don't have the time to read read all of those, uh, so I don't. But uh, you know, what I would suggest is, yeah, have a look, see if it's useful. And if it's good, you can continue using it. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, because of uh, Barclays Bible, uh, any thoughts? Oh, that's that okay. mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, again, this is uh, Barclays I haven't used uh, much. I, I mean, I haven't used it at all. Okay. So I wouldn't know. Yeah. So there are a lot of, you know, commentaries. And even today, many uh, well-known Bible teachers have put out their commentaries. So you'll have... Uh, you know, um, Bibles with commentaries by many of the leading Bible teachers today. Uh, they have put out their own commentaries, uh, but it's very difficult to read, you know, everybody's <laughs> commentary. So I would just suggest pick ones that uh, you are comfortable with. You know, I, of course, for me, my criteria was um, they, they had to be spirit-filled, Pentecostal backgrounds, you know, charismatic. They need to believe in the work of the Spirit and the gifts because how how they interpret Scripture and the commentaries on Scripture uh, would obviously come from their theological position, you know. And uh, uh, while in some cases it's okay to read anybody's commentary, in some cases it's important that the commentary doesn't discredit the work of the Holy Spirit or doesn't you know, uh, discredit the, the gifts of the spirit and the anointing and the miracles and the healings. I mean, why waste time reading those kinds of things? So I intentionally have selected uh, the ones I read or look, look into as people with that theological position. But uh, in some cases, it's good to, you know, to, to read, uh, you know, someone, especially in things that don't relate to the work of the spirit. Uh, if it has to do with just general, you know, book background, culture, history, then definitely I would be open. Uh, in fact, when I do book studies, then I do read, uh, you know, for example, in studying Daniel or in studying Revelation, uh, some of the best commentaries on the books are written, you know, from professors from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. So, you know, they're not necessarily spiritual charismatic type but when it comes to those subjects they're very good so um, uh, it's good to read those things so you know so go with what you're comfortable with what you have time to read and uh, yeah uh, but the day, one more yeah. Sorry. go ahead go ahead uh, but so these people uh, who has written commentaries would be quite a long while ago right uh, do you think there could be a progression in the revelation and um, if yes, then is there a modern day theologians who has written commentaries? 
Mm-hmm. Uh, usually, the progress may have been marginal, uh, but not so much in the uh, in in the theological side, but more in the historical or archaeological findings or discoveries. In those cases, yeah, you know, if the, the commentary was written in the 1950s, of course, you know, about 70 years have elapsed, or if it was written in the 1960s, 70 years have elapsed or so more. And therefore, there, there, there will definitely be more archaeological findings and other things that, that help. But in, in the essence of the theology, theological understanding, mm, there's not too much change. Um, Except when it, of course, when it comes to end time prophecy, like, uh, you know, when it comes to studying uh, uh, revelation or something, people always keep coming up with new ideas. And so I don't bother too much with them. I stay with the uh, the, the traditional, uh, you know, uh, understanding of the end times. And that's perfectly fine. It's, it's very consistent. Um, but other than that, in the theological insight, understanding itself, uh, it's pretty much consistent. Uh, yes, there is fresh insight, but the doc- doctrinally things do- haven't changed. It is the same. Maybe there's fresh revelation, fresh insight. Yeah. Thank you, Mas. Okay. So uh, with this, we'll wrap up chapter three. I've given you some recommended commentaries and so on. And you could, you know, I'm not saying you have to use them. I'm just saying that's what I use and uh, I can share about that. So we'll go for a break now. Uh, We'll be back in 10 minutes and then we will proceed to the next chapter, which is to talk about uh, the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And then maybe we'll have time to get into one more chapter, which is to talk about culture and how, you know, we have to keep that in mind and we interpret scripture. So we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you.